so this kind of gives you a view of kind of how those things, those move forward. So obviously our approach to advanced biofuels is quite different from how biofuels of the first generation advanced. Corn ethanol and soybean biodiesel markets formed in when, a time, when the time was ripe. So they benefited from readily available feedstocks. So there's already a business model that was out there. They had off the shelf technology. People have been fermenting these for years. Uh, and there was a vibrant investment climate. This was prior to the recession, and so there was money floating around, and everybody was in. And they had, with these limited barriers of entry, biofuels rapidly expanded to meet the needs and actually exceed the needs that are sitting in the renewable fuel standard that Congress set. But when we're looking at advan developing advanced biofuels, the circumstances are actually considerably um, different and actually much more challenging. Um, so we, we are facing challenges that have never been seen by the first generation of, of biofuels, whether it's the scale up of the technology or just getting the money to go ahead and do that. So I'll talk about really the three main challenges that we're seeing in the formation. So firstly around feedstocks, um, they're around conversion technology and financing. And maybe one way to, to hold the industry is it's not just one industry that's being developed, it's two. You've got to find feedstocks and develop a feedstock industry, and you've got to develop the conversion technology that sits around it. Um, the good news is the, the daunting nature of each of these challenges um, is not unsurmountable. Um, they may cause some to actually, um, some of the commentators actually to, to find ways to say this industry can never come to commercialization at scale. Um, and others to say this will never be something that can meet the needs of the 21st century. So I want to actually break some of these myths down so that we can say what's the reality of these advanced biofuels. On the feedstock side, advanced biofuels in general and cellulosic biofuels specifically do not have an existing or well-defined feedstock supply chain. That's the reality. Um, there's nobody out there growing you know, huge swatches of land with 15 feet tall grasses and they know how to cut them down and they know how to bring them into a plant that just doesn't exist. So that's something that, that has to be taken care of. Um, and it will take time, and it's going to take partnerships. It's going to take a lot of working with others in the, in the value chain. So we're, we're working with landowners, farmers, seed companies, agriculture and forestry equipment, OEMs. You've got to build the equipment. We're working with the agricultural banking sector so you can figure out how you finance it. You've got to work with transportation companies to be able to move it. So all these things have to happen, and they're happening nowadays. And what's encouraging is we're actually seeing some of these partnerships forming. And we're seeing players on the feedstock supply chain start to enter. And partnerships that we're seeing range from genetics development to field trial testing for these materials. And at BP, we're heavily involved in these partnerships. For instance, another California-based company, Mendel, um, we've taken an investment in a number of years ago. And we've been working with them to develop a feedstock called Miscanthus. Um, and we have other partnerships and investments ranging from com private companies to universities to the USDA. Um, working at how we're going to advance energy canes and, energy, and other energy grasses. And we've started to see seed, equipment company, seed companies and equipment companies actually come into this and we start to respond to the market and start thinking about how they bring technology into the place. So it's been really um, encouraging. On the conversion technology side, one of the key challenges has been how do you take this biomass, this real woody fiber, and, and convert that into a fuel. And with advanced biofuels, our goal is actually to take the most abundant source of this woody fiber, which is you know, the source of cellulose for us. And we need to find a way to unlock the raw sugars and to make that, um, and to do that actually in, a, in an economic way. And that's been quite a challenge. Uh, but once you actually find a way to unlock those sugars, the conversion at very large scale is, is feasible. And so it meets that criteria we talked about, the ability for it to scale uh, and not just be a boutique fuel. And we think we can get there with dedicated energy products crops. We're seeing a number of technology companies, including ourselves, actually developing this um, capability on the conversion side. And we're seeing it help address the critical advances that we're going to need in bio biofuels going forward. So the biotechnology tools that weren't available 10 years ago are now starting to develop promise for us at the bench lab pilot and demonstration scale. And we're now seeing it's not about inventing these technologies. It's about how we're going to figure out how to scale these technologies at the lowest cost. So it's becoming an engineering challenge more than a biology challenge at this point. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a sense of what created the opportunity and, and why we're seeking it. So the renewable fuel standard that I briefly mentioned was what the government put in place at the end of 2007. And they created a tremendous opportunity for cellulosics. Um, and I think I might have. Missed it. There we go. So like almost every segment in today's economy, um, 
they, they created this opportunity for 16 billion gallons. So uh, there's, there's a, a direct requirement to start to blend in these, these volumes. And that created a, a very interesting opportunity for us. But like almost every segment of today's economy, another major challenge that we're facing to, to go ahead and capture this is financing. So for, the fir for biofuels, the first obstacle is that project financing um, is really not available because of the risk associated with the technology not being proven and the feedstocks not being re readily available. Um, and so we're looking for continued stability in the government support mechanisms to go forward. The private investors in the banking sector have um, been in a very different state than they were when the conventional biofuels, the yellow part, was being formed. Um, the banking sector support for these kind of commercial scale facilities has just gone post the recession. And the, the likelihood of that space coming back anytime soon is, I think, very, very unlikely. And so what we're starting to see is a changing of the shape of the industry. Um, and you're seeing a diverse set of players coming into the place now. And you've got companies like ourselves. We've had autos like GM starting to invest in the, in the industry, Dow, DuPont, uh, foreign oils such as Total and Shell coming into the US space and investing. And we're seeing that as a really a bridge for us to maintain momentum on this industry um, while we, we wait for the economy to recover and the traditional sources of financing to recover. Um, but we are going to need a strengthening of the global financial markets for this, for this industry to reach material scale. So if you look at that, that number of 16 billion gallons, we need hundreds of conversion facilities to be built. So hundreds of billions of dollars have to come into the US in the next 10 years to meet those demands. So it's not going to come on just the backs of big energy companies. It's going to have to become a private sector investment. Um, so, so, so how are we going to get there? What's the case for developing cellulosic biofuels? And as I mentioned earlier, one of the of BP's um, three areas for focus has been this cellulosics. And that's because we actually believe the technology will play a key role in delivering the potential for this low carbon, low cost, scalable, sustainable transport option. So we, we simply believe that there's no other form of biofuels that has the potential to deliver this volume at low cost. And that's why we're putting a significant investment behind it. The right feedstocks that we have that we're looking at grown with the right technologies can actually deliver four to five times as much ethanol on a per acre basis than we have today with today's conventional uh, biofuels. So that gives us a, a wide range of opportunities um, for this. And actually, if you think about where we have today's conventional biofuels, they're focused in the Midwest because that's where you have the, you know, the corn industry. And you look at what can happen for cellulosics is we can have everything from woods to grasses to waste. So the scalability and the regionality of this business is much more uh, advantageous for the US in terms of investments. Um, so here in the US on cellulosics, um, it's forming an important part of our strategy. And we are developing a very robust approach to how we're going to move forward. We've got the two biotech labs in California that I mentioned earlier. We also have, as you look in the lower right hand corner, a 1.4 million gallon demonstration facility in Louisiana. Um, and we are in the midst of developing uh, our first commercial project, which is a 36 million gallon uh, conversion facility in, in the middle of Florida. Um, and we're confident that the partnerships and investments that BP has been taking have, in order to form this value chain are, are ready to start to move forward. We think we've chosen um, the right feedstocks with our dedicated energy gra uh, grasses. We're very confident in a biochemical approach that we've taken um, for the conversion technology, and we're forcefully bringing those together today. So when you think about those choices, they're not always the easiest um, in, in the world of cellulosics. But again, our whole focus is how are we going to get to long term? How are we going to be scalable? How are we going to be economic? And we need to be low cost and low carbon along the way. And that's where, why we've, we focus in this direction. Um, in San Diego here, our researchers and scientists are drawing upon the expertise that we have in uh, enzymology. We do synthetic biology, fermentation, characterization of the bioengineering processes. And all of this is in a goal to develop a very cost-effective manufacturing process for us to deploy based on these perennial grasses. In fact, the technologies that we're developing at San Diego are actually you know, get immediately applied into the demonstration facility at Jennings. And there we're using those to validate the robustness of what we do on the bench to see if it's actually scalable as we go into commercialization. So that scalable um, aspect is very important for us. And in Jennings, the 1.4 million gallon facility is really a, a process demonstration facility. So it's not sitting there churning out ethanol for sale. 
what really it does is it churns out data for us so that we can decide how we can optimize the process as we go forward to keep driving the costs down and then driving the um, investment down as we, we build the capital profile going forward. So it's really an integrated continuous process center. It's like a, a big computer for us to see how we optimize things. Um, and some of the many, um, many issues related to commercial scale production, we actually are testing at this site. So we're learning uh, how to harvest and how to bring it in, um, how to manage enzyme production. We produce enzymes on site in, in, inside the process. We're thinking about things like enzyme um, efficiencies. How are we going to take the product and manage it in a quality basis if we take it out? What are the oper operating procedures? How do we manage safety? All those things are being developed in Jennings. And the really good news is that we're having tremendous results from the efforts of San Diego and Jennings. And it's, uh, right, we're regularly produced um, ethanol at Jennings. So we have multiple runs that go on. Um, and we're giving us confidence to move forward in this commercial scale facility that I mentioned before. So what we have going forward is a facility in Highlands County, Florida. So it's kind of central Florida, about three hours from Orlando or Tampa or Palm Beach. Um, and we're, what we're doing there is we're building the first fully integrated commercial scale facility to produce cellulosic biofuels in the U.S. And I say fully integrated because we actually have a model where we've leased 20,000 acres of land. We are, we are growing those crops. There will be BP crops grown on BP land. They will be brought into the conversion facility and use our proprietary technology. And then we're using the back end of our understanding um, to kind of bring forward that into the fuels value chain. So it's a, ver a really first fully integrated chain. Um, that facility will, will um, take those energy grasses that I mentioned, these 15 feet tall, 12 to 15 feet tall grasses, and we're going to use that biological fermentation to convert those. And we're focused right now on things like energy, energy cane, which is uh, sugar cane without the sugar, uh, and napier grass, which is sometimes called elephant grass, huge grasses. And we'll, we'll continue to work on other options for grasses. And what we see is the, the material that we're going to produce at this facility will have... Um, will have major improvements on the, on the use of greenhouse gases. So the EPA has estimated that cellulosic biofuels produced using energy grasses will achieve a greater than 60% 60, 60 reduction in greenhouse gases from today's conventional gall gallons. So we are moving in the right direction. The total investment in the facility, um, all the way from the feedstocks to the conversion facility, will be in ex excess of $400 million. And we've already begun construction of the farm. So we broke ground on the farm this year. Uh, it's a quite an endeavor to uh, build a 20,000 acre farm, as I've learned. Didn't know much about that beforehand, but most farms are built out in 500 to 1,000 acres, and we're building kind of 20 world scale farms at once. And so that, that's going on. And we'll break ground on the industrial portion sometime next year. So as you see, um, we're, we're, we're starting down the path, and I want to assure you that the way we look at the Highlands facility, it's not our first and it's not our last. Uh, we've got to be able to kind of bring this technology forward at scale and continue to advance it. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, in addition to cellulosic biofuels, BP is investing in the research and technology development in biobutanol, um, we have, uh, which is an advanced form of, of a molecule from ethanol. And for example, if you think about